Travel is pleased to be bringing you this webinar today, Flyway Expeditions, Conservation in the Bahamas. Uh, we'll be discussing next steps in the implementation of the Flyway Expeditions uh, program and Audubon's International Alliances program, specifically as it relates to the Bahamas, uh, and talking about supporting conservation of important bird areas and strengthening local communities. We're joined today uh, by several panelists and guests. Uh, we've got Dave Ewart and Matt, Jeff uh, excuse me, Matt Jeffrey from the National Audubon Society. Uh, we're joined by Dave Ewart from the, Nas uh, the Nature Conservancy. We have Lee Altadonna as a panelist uh, from Wincote Audubon and also uh, Audubon's board, and also uh, our own Debbie Sturdivant Jordan from Holbrook Travel. Uh, our agenda today will be uh, we'll have Matt giving some opening uh, some opening remarks about Audubon's bird-based tourism initiative and Audubon in the Bahamas. Uh, then Debbie will tell us a little bit more about flyaway expeditions and our Bahamas programs. Dave Ewart will talk a little bit about Bahamas conservation programs, uh, and then we'll open it up for the panel discussion and Q&A. So again, if you have any questions that you'd like to submit for our panelists, please feel free to do those. Please feel free to do so, and I will direct those to our panelists. Uh, I will briefly introduce our speakers. Uh, Matt Jeffrey, as I mentioned, is uh, with National Audubon Society. He's the Deputy Director of the International Alliances Program. Matt has been with Audubon since 2006. He has uh, over 15 years of experience in the environmental conservation field, and his focus has been on the protection of important bird areas in Latin America and the Caribbean. Next, we're joined by Debbie Sturdman Jordan from Holbrook Travel. Uh, Debbie is our specialty travel consultant and birding tour expert, and she has a long-lived passion for travel, nature, and boating. She sailed from California to Florida at an early age and then spent time in Costa Rica, Panama, and the Galapagos. Debbie has traveled to 35 countries and has partnered with over 100 different group leaders uh, in her time at Holbrook. Uh, and then lastly, we're joined by Dave Ewart the, uh, from the Nature Conservancy. Uh, he is a conservation scientist and uh, uh, with the Migratory Bird Program. Uh, he studies winter habitat of the Kirtland's warbler in the Bahamas and the protection of migratory birds in the Great Lakes. Dr. Ewart has a, B, a bachelor uh, degree from the University of Michigan and uh, his master's and PhD from the City University of New York. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Matt. Uh, Matt, welcome. Uh, Thank you. I just arrived. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Um, sorry, I was a little bit late there, but hopefully, uh, hopefully this works. So, welcome everyone. It's uh, Matt Jeffrey here. I'm the deputy director for Audubon's International Alliances program. Uh, I just want to confirm that you can see my screen. It should be. Yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. So, so welcome everyone and thank you for spending the time with us today to talk, I think, about a really exciting program, um, you know, both in the Bahamas but more generally. And what I'll do right now is just walk through you know, what we're doing and who we are um, and why, why you may want to care and, and be a part of uh, these flyway expeditions. Um, so, so there's no, there's no. Um, everyone on the line here realizes that there are migratory flyways uh, that take birds from the United States. So Audubon's priority species from the United States and many, many more fly all the way down to Central America and the Caribbean and South America each and every year. In fact, 50% or more uh, of those birds spend up to 10, 10 months of the year outside of the United States. They sort of run back up here to breed and then run, run back to the tropics um, and sort of who can blame them. But uh, many, of the, um, many of them are in rapid decline and mainly because uh, many of the habitats outside the U.S. are disappearing. And so increasingly we're seeing that uh, birds, uh, birds that migrate outside the U.S. are in, in fast decline because of the disappearing wintering habitats. And so the International Alliances Program is really focusing on Audubon's priority species, like the piping clover here in the, in the photo, where they're, uh, and there's a sandling in the back there, <laughs> but um, where they're wintering and how can we work with the local organizations and the local communities to enhance the conservation and better support the habitats that these birds need. Uh, species like the wood thrush that, that have seen a 60% decline in the last 40 years is another example. So these are uh, Audubon's priority species. 
And here's just an example of what we're up against. This is actually the Maya Biosphere Reserve in Guatemala. Um, and this is just deforestation rates uh, between the year 2000 and 2016. So this is 16 years. In the areas where there are sort of community-based conservation programs, while we still have deforestation up to 10% here since 2000, um, it's much less than the 90% deforestation rate that's happened outside of those conservation areas. So the work with communities and work with local organizations to reduce this deforestation rate is really important. And that's really what this program is really helping to support. So why bird tourism? Why bird-based tourism? Um, it engages and empowers the communities. So it gets them to care and be better stewards of the habitats that, they, they, that surround them. Um, it links economic development with that conservation movement. And so we're not just talking, go and look after these trees and these birds because they're beautiful and we care about them. We're saying if you do it well, you could actually make money out of this. And that's a very different conversation uh, than, than we've traditionally had uh, as a conservation group. Uh, it definitely supports conservation, habitat conservation. Um, and what's more important is actually put birds on the political spectrum. Um, because we're now talking economics and jobs, different parts of the governments are actually actually care about what is happening. Um, and so we're having a big impact on the policy front as well. Uh, our goals for the program that we've just finished uh, with the Inter-American Development Bank, which was over three years, were really simple. We increased the number of people benefiting from bird tourism and therefore increased their conservation stewardship. Uh, can we increase uh, visitation to some of the protected areas so that they have more money so that they can care for the resources better? Um, and can we improve some sort of, can we show that we're improving protections as we move forward? I'm going to be quiet for two seconds and just play this How great video birds about the need business. In 2015, the National Audubon Society, in partnership with the Multilateral Investment Fund, a member of the IDB group, embarked on an ambitious initiative called Strengthening Bird-Based Tourism as a Conservation and Sustainable Development Tool. The project worked with local NGO partners in four different countries, Paraguay, Belize, Guatemala, and the Bahamas. In each country, communities are struggling to create income in ways that don't degrade the natural resource base. Audubon and our local partner NGOs set out to help locals see the opportunity in ecotourism and how to access the potential income it could bring them. The project pinpointed impoverished towns near existing protected areas and important bird areas that are also rich in biodiversity. In an effort to open doors, the initiative developed comprehensive bird guide training curriculums at a basic introduction level and advanced level. Taken over multiple weeks, trainings included classroom and field experiences. Before, uh, we were just doing bird watching by ourselves, but after this training that they gave us, we had learned a lot of experience, a lot of uh, uh, knowledge in general for all of the concept of birds. The local guides are so, they want to show you a good time. They want you to see the birds. They want you to see the nature. And they just, they made you feel comfortable. They made you feel good. And um, I almost had some emotional experiences. It, it's just been absolutely spectacular. So far, more than 275 birding guides graduated from basic training. And over 70 guides have graduated from advanced training. Today, over 119 of the trained guides and park staff contribute to citizen science using the eBird platform to record their bird sightings in order to help organizations predict changes to bird populations. To strengthen bird ecotourism and improve the credibility of local businesses, the initiative delivered training for over 400 local small to medium-sized businesses focusing on business management, marketing, communication, and hospitality. <laughs> To highlight sites and guide tours to visit the best birding destinations, six new national birding trail systems were developed. And all five destinations held bird festivals, helping to cement stakeholder relationships and highlight the wealth of bird tourism in the country. Audubon's bird-based tourism initiative had a wide-reaching impact. Nearly 1,800 adults attended conservation programs on birding, and over 5,500 students participated in environmental education programs related to birds. 
The initiative also pushed momentum forward for the creation of the 92,000 acre Jolt National Park in the Bahamas, a critical area for endangered shorebirds like the piping plover. Local people, NGOs, and government agencies can now see the enormous potential of bird-based tourism through this initiative. Together, we have made great strides in protecting birds and their habitats and in providing people with alternative sustainable livelihoods. After all, where birds thrive, people prosper. Okay, uh, thanks for, for sitting through that. Hopefully you're sort of getting a sense of, of um, the difference this project is making for local communities, uh, birds and conservation. Uh, but I was actually in a group just with Holbrook just uh, last week, and one of the questions that came up is, so, so why an Audubon trade guide versus somebody else? Somebody else. And here's the reason. The, the comprehensive curriculum, which covers bird, everything from bird biology down to ethics and safety and, and how to organize, uh, how to set up organizations, um, and with guides next to protected areas and important bird areas, they went through 90, over 90 hours of theoretical work. So that curriculum took 90 hours of training in the classroom. In addition, they also went through um, an additional sort of 20, 28 to 35 hours of field work with trained guides to sort of hone those skills in and get, get the skills necessary to give, uh, make sure that uh, any tourist has a really good and safe time. Uh, obviously, it's not one go for the training. It was over several weeks. So these trainings are actually spaced over multiple months. So that multiple multiple times they get to experience and learn about birds. And in order to graduate, they actually had to pass um, written. They had to pass written exams and participate in all of the activities at least 75% of the time. So these are really dedicated individuals. Um, that have gone through a very rigorous training program, um, you know, that, that are going to help, you know, really set the bar very high for guides going forwards. But the guides, you know, the guides that went through this, they, they really, it was really a life-changing experience for a lot of them. So it really, really helped them open their eyes and become the stewards that we hoped they would um, in the environment. And so we 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 continuously hear how the project and the program changed people's lives. It woke them up to the nature around them and it really has changed the way in which they steward the environment. And as mentioned in the video, we got the 92,000 acre Jolta Keys protected, um, but it also went a long way to reducing poaching in places like Coxcomb in Belize by up to 95%. Um, and it also created advocacy groups and, and birding groups that now really do stop uh, many of the negative things that happen for that's driving the deforestation the loss of habitat so we're very very pleased and our analysis um, of the impacts of the project to the communities show that uh, in places like Guatemala we have an over a 900 percent increase in small to medium enterprises uh, of their revenue and we're seeing an increase of up to 46 percent um, of the bird guides that went through the training, they've increased their revenue by six, 46 percent. And the changes in attitudes to the environment with those communities is also pretty impressive, with almost 20 percent increase in positive attitudes. Similar for Belize, uh, similar numbers, not quite as high as Guatemala, but, but we still, still are able to show that this training and this program really does support local livelihoods. Um, and just transitioning a little bit here into the Bahamas quickly, because that's really what David's going to be talking about from here on out. Um, without, before this project, we, birded, we knew that birding was happening in the Bahamas, um, but we actually analyzed the statistics and came up with the fact that it's a $39 million industry without any effort uh, by the government at that point. So it's a really significant um, avenue, and this is the number that really open the doors with ministries of tourism and other entities within the government that have, that have helped us move this whole process forward. And we were really there because of the conservation linkage. It really is, we had, had discovered across the Bahamas where the piping clover was and where in fact most of the key sites for sure but were. And so we we're able to sort of marry uh, the conservation efforts with those conservation programs 
and this project to really have a significant impact on the birds. So why the Bahamas? Well, it's 340 bird species. Now that's less than places like Costa Rica and, and Panama and even Colombia, but, um, but it's still pretty impressive. And there are six endemics that you're not going to be able to see anywhere else in the world. Um, it's English speaking, it's, sh it's a short flight, um, there's lots to explore, um, and there's other activities that you can mix with the birding, so, such as fly fishing, diving, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I think David's going to go through some of the birds, but we have uh, endemics like the Christian endangered Bahama Oriole, the uh, Bahama Swallow, the Bahama Yellowthroat, the Bahama Warbler, a brand new split uh, endemic on Inagua Island called the Inagua Woodstar. Uh, you're not going to see this anywhere else but Inagua. Um, and you've got great facilities and opportunities in places like uh, New Providence, which for many is, is called Nassau. Nassau is a capital city, um, but New Providence is the island. Andros, Inagua with the flamingos. Uh, Audubon has been working there since 1952. Abaco with the parrots. Um, and I'm going to hand it over now back to the, the, the team to, to uh, go on to the next stage. Great, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Uh, now I will hand it over to Debbie. Uh, Debbie, welcome. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Let me see if I can do this. Right. So, um, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. It's really great to be here this afternoon. And um, we are going to go over these topics during my little session here. Basically, um, a little bit about Holbrook and what makes these programs different from some of our other birding expeditions and talking about the Bahamas and, and what you can do to help. So, um, first about Holbrook Travel. Um, our founder, Giovanna Holbrook, uh, really has a great passion for nature and conservation that goes back to the early 70s. She once told me that she was hosting a bus tour in Europe and the ladies on the world and shopping, getting their passports stamped. But uh, as they traveled from country to country, sometimes they didn't even realize where they were. It was really a official sightseeing tour. So after that trip, she told me that she decided to offer affordable educational that did a lot more about um, the people and the customs and the nature of that country, and particularly the nature, because as a pioneer of ecotourism, uh, she took one of the first groups to the Galapagos Islands um, back in 1971 aboard a retired naval vessel. On that trip, she served as the chief cook and bottle washer, as well as, um, you know, in encouraging her group of folks that are, um, they basically are a, uh, were a group of scientists from the University of Florida. So she uh, had distinguished recovers on that trip. Uh, like Dr. Archie Carr, Tom Emmel, and Dr. Bill Hardy. So um, back in then in the 80s, she created Salvo Verde Lodge when she realized that uh, the area was quickly being deforested and since then has saved 500 acres of rainforest there with the Salvo Verde Lodge as a way to um, have sustainable tourism in the area. Um, she's been a great inspiration to a lot of people in the, that region. As, as well as um, been protecting 330 bird species and a recovering population of the Great Green Claws. So um, how are the flyways different? Um, we, Matt has just given us a really great overview of that and, um, you know, mainly we're trying to protect important bird areas at key sites in Latin America and the Caribbean. So obviously your travel to these areas has that a direct economic impact and by visiting um, with these locally trained guides you'll be able to um, support the local conservation and the communities will benefit from ecotourism. We're doing our best to spread the word with this uh, initiative and so far over 50 people have participated in programs in Guatemala, Co Colombia and Belize and we have 84 planned for 2018 to be traveling down to uh, travel on these flyways programs. So um, here's just a few of the programs that we are offering through um, the flyway initiative. Uh, this one travels to the wonderful Biosphere Reserve in Guatemala, out to the Guacamayas um, 
field station. This one goes around the uh, Lake Atitlan area up in the highlands and in Belize, a nice combination, a uh, really affordable program too, um, going to Coxcomb and some of the other wonderful uh, areas in Belize. And there's also one in Colombia, and, but we're really here to talk about Bahamas today. So this one is um, the programs that we have to plan. Um, you can um, choose dates of your own or um, you can join one of the programs that we already have set up. Um, in March, Dave Ewart will be uh, leading a group with, that's going to Eleuthera. And um, as you can see here, the Kirtland Swarbler is going to be a, a big target there. I think Matt's already covered a lot of this. Um, as far as the, um, the different organizations that will be uh, highlighted, there will be uh, hopefully a lot of um, collaboration with local folks on the trip. And um, I haven't yet, I've only been to Andros, which is an amazing place. I, I hope I get a chance maybe to go to one of these other islands. Um, so how can you help? You can organize a trip, you know, as I mentioned, a custom trip on your date uh, for your bird club or chapter, Audubon chapter, and, um, or you can participate on one of these programs I was mentioning. So. Uh, uh, this is a whole other webinar on how to, to form your own group, but uh, as you can see by these bullets, it really is it's something that is an enriching for your chapter as well as uh, working you know, to conserve these areas in, uh, in the other end of the flyways. And when you work with us, you don't really have to um, worry about the details. We take care of everything. Um, all right, so these are the programs that we have um, that are being led, coming up, led by John Beavers, Guatemala and Bahamas, uh, by Dave in March, and uh, Matt's leading one to Inagua in December, and that's December 7th to 15th. So um, you try, I guess it'll be time to turn this over back to you, Lindsay. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Debbie. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Dr. Dave Ewart. Okay. Can everybody see the slide okay? Yes, we can see your screen. All right, there we go. All right, well, it's a pleasure to uh, be talking with everybody here. And what I'll do is outline some of the highlights that we're likely to see on each of the uh, <clears throat> three islands, which are part of this tour, starting out with Andros, that Matt has already talked a bit about. Andros is famous for not only the extensive pine forests and mangrove areas on the west side of the island, but also for these blue holes where the limestone is dissolved and you get these freshwater circular deep blue holes that are scattered through the landscape. It's a great place for tortoises and iguanas, or not the tortoises, but iguanas, and a number of endemic bird species that we're very likely to see on the tour. And particularly, uh, we may not see it quite this close, but the Bahama Oriole, which is endemic to Andros, nowhere else in the world, and occurs in some of the settlements on the east side of Andros, and some researchers from University of Maryland, Baltimore, are also finding that they're nesting back in the pines, in areas that have recently been established as a national park by the Bahamas National Trust, an NGO which is responsible for establishing and maintaining National Parks in the Bahamas, and we would be talking with some of their staff during the course of this tour. From here, from Andros, we would then go to Eleuthera, which is an island that does not have pine, but in, is in fact dominated by a, a hardwood thicket forest called coppice, and it is here that we'll see a variety of birds that are characteristic of these thickets, including the western spindalis, a, family of birds endemic to the West Indies, which occurs locally on Eleuthera. And these will pop up in the coppice as we, as we go around. La Sagra's flycatcher, another bird that's very characteristic of the coppice. And this is a strictly a, a northern West Indian species that includes Bahamas in its range. And a real special bird, the great lizard cuckoo, very large cuckoo that's very curious, hops around the ground, picking up anolis lizards and whatever else it can find. 
that we will see on Eleuthera. This bird has a very peculiar distribution being found in the Bahamas only on Eleuthera and on Andros. So we have two chances to see this very spectacular bird. And we'll look around the landscape for a couple of shrubs in particular, one of being black torch. This blackberry is very characteristic of the plant. We'll also, and it's only about uh, three to six feet tall. Another plant we'll look for is wild sage, which also is a very low scraggly shrub, but has the characteristic white fruit you may see in the upper part of the slide or magenta, depending on which island you will find yourself. And in those areas where there's a lot of fruit, we find a bird we'll be looking for, especially the Kirtland's warbler. It, as you know, breeds primarily in Michigan, where close to 99% of the world's population breeds, and virtually all the world's population breeds in the Bahamas, and especially on Eleuthera and the three other islands in the central Bahamas. So we've got a very good chance of seeing these birds, and we'll talk with local Bahamians about actions that they're taking to help maintain habitat that produces the shrubs, that produces the fruit, that attracts the Kirtland warbler. And we'll also have a chance to talk with a local goat farmer who, where we find some of the highest densities of Kirtland warblers anywhere on the Bahamas. We'll also see from time to time other spectacular birds. Uh, here's the yellow crying night heron uh, giving its courtship display at one of the plant, a native plant preserve that we would visit and spend one night very close to that plant preserve and see a number of other winter resident species and other permanent resident species like greater Antillian bullfinch in this kind of a landscape. Then we'll go to Abaco, which is a pine dominated island, uh, which has a number of special birds, the olive capped warbler that Matt has already showed you a slide of and a number of other species like the Bahama warbler, which is endemic to the Bahamas, the Bahama swallow, which can be found quite readily in parts of Abaco. And especially we'll be looking for the so-called Bahama parrot, which is uh, a race of the Cuban parrot with a very characteristic pink throat, white forehead, which occurs in and around Abaco National Park. It's one of the larger national parks, which is maintained by the Bahamas National Trust. And so we should see a lot of other birds in association with the Bahamas parrot. It's not a good place for Cortland's warbler. We've spent three weeks there a couple of years ago and found three birds on one day at one site only. So we'll see a different suite of birds on each island. So that'll give you a brief overview of what we hope to see uh, on the Bahamas, each island having its own special features and traits and distinctive birds. And I will then pass it right along. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and open it up now for a question and answer session. Um, just as a reminder to our attendees, um, if you have any questions that you'd like to submit, you can type it in the questions pane in your control panel. Uh, you'll just type it in and click send and then those uh, questions will be sent to us and we'll be able to direct them to our panelists. Uh, so if you do have any questions, please feel free to send them our way. Um, to start off, I'm going to uh, direct this question to Matt. Uh, Matt, we have a question um, about the choosing Bahamas as a destination um, for the International Alliances program and I guess sort of a broader sense, how, how are different destinations chosen? Yeah, well, thanks, thanks for that question. It's a good one. It's one we get asked many times. So um, or, um, really one of the reasons the Bahamas uh, was included in this sort of pilot, uh, first four country pilot um, phase of the initiative was uh, three reasons, really. One um, is we had an active conservation program, so it's a really, really important place for uh, the Atlantic coast population of piping plovers. Um, Andros alone has uh, probably between uh, 15 and 25 percent of the Atlantic coast population. Um, so from a conservation standpoint, really, really important. The second piece, the second layer that, um, and, th and there are others like Bahama Oriole, and there's, there's, there's uh, many warblers from the United States as well. So that's sort of the conservation reason um, that we were there. The second real piece uh, of, uh, or the reason, 
is when you get out, uh, everyone, when you think about the Bahamas, uh, it's been sold for so many years as sun, sea, and surf. Um, that that's, you know, when you picture the Bahamas, you picture these big resorts with beautiful golden beaches that are miles long and, um, um, and, and it's full of, um, it's full of sort of uh, people in bathing suits and, and enjoying the sun. That really is not the case. That, that's really one or two islands in the Bahamas. When we, when we get to places like Andros and some of the other islands, they are extremely beautiful but in different ways. Um, and they're not well uh, traveled. So Andros is like in a wilderness almost with very little, uh, there's only about 6,000 people on the entire island, north and south, um, almost no tourists um, off the beaten track. And it really is uh, just a, a huge island with um, you know, pine forests um, and very little opportu uh, employment opportunity. And so in fact, the unemployment rate and the poverty rate on Andros and, in fact, the Inagua um, are almost that of Guatemala and Belize um, because all of the economy of the, of the Bahamas is in Nassau, in sort of one or two islands. Um, so, it's, so we had the poverty la layer. And then we wanted an organization uh, that is capable and effective um, to be able to take on uh, this, this, this project. And so the Bahamas National Trust, who are our bird life partner in the country and, and an organization that Audubon actually helped found back in the uh, late 1950s, um, is a very capable organization of, of, of uh, executing the project really effectively. Um, and so we're very happy to partner with them um, in executing the project. So sort of those three factors are, are really how we chose and why we're in the Bahamas. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we have another question that kind of ties in with something that you said um, about this kind of perception of the Bahamas as a vacation destination and not not a lot of people necessarily understand some of the more natural um, uh, aspects, uh, especially as it pertains to birding. What kind of challenges are there uh, to overcoming those perceptions and how do you address those with potential uh, birders slash travelers? And I would direct that um, either to Matt or to Dave. Do you, Dave, do you want to take that or do you want me to start? Uh, you can start, Matt, and then I can follow up. It. Yes, cool. um, so I think there is a real perception out there and, and Bahamas is not known as a birding destination. Yet, as you saw from the, the economics, there are actually a lot of people actually claim to go birding in the Bahamas, or at least participate in, in or look at birds while they're visiting. And so, um, I think there um, there was it was just a non uh, when we started on places like Andros, for example, there was not one person on the island that could actually take anyone around and show them the birds. And now, uh, you actually have uh, you know 30 over 30 people that will would be able to work with you. Um, to show you birds, and then there are six that went through the advanced training that, that would really show you, uh, the, uh, you know, and, and take you and, and tell you the stories. Um, so we really created, we, we really started from scratch almost of creating an industry um, that's based on birds and nature tourism. I think um, uh, it's important to try and link uh, more than just birds there uh, if, if you get the opportunity. Um, the government was not investing in anything, anything to do with birds or nature or even that much ecotourism. And so this project has really prompted them to realize there is an industry there. It is an important niche for them um, that they should be taking more advantage of. And so the government's actually starting to advertise and work with us um, and our partners to advertise the country as a, a potential birding destination. And then for anyone that's been there, anyone that has actually gone and tried to go birding there and, and seen what is on offer, um, it really is a hidden gem that not many birders know about. And I've spoken to many people that have had um, uh, extremely amazing birding days there where uh, they've, they've, they've had better birding days there than, than often many other places. Uh, for example, I've been there in the spring migration, a little bit later in spring, and we've had uh, fallouts of, of uh, warblers and other uh, swifts and swallows and other things. And uh, within a sort of 20-meter road, you had, I think it was a, like 
15 to 18 species of warbler and they're, they're eye level, you're not straining your neck to look at them in the trees. Um, and so there, there are some pretty special opportunities like that. Um, and there's nowhere else in the world you're going to see pop, uh, populations of piping plovers or some of the shorebirds as easily as you can there. Um, and, you know, interestingly, you have the endemics, again, not going to be able to see them anywhere else in the world. Uh, but you also have a lot of regional endemics, uh, birds that, that don't make it to the United States, but do make it as far as the Bahamas. Um, and they're uh, fairly easy to see there. So, so you really have this sort of uh, smorgasbord of, of birds and birding opportunities that uh, make it a very special place and, and experiences that you're just not going to have um, any other, anywhere else. David? Yeah, I think you said it very well, Matt. And I think the other thing that's very attractive about the Bahamas is just a very re relaxed country to be. And people are very warm and welcoming. And the endemics, by and large, are quite easily found, unlike many parts of the world. So it provides a really well-balanced and interesting trip, not only from the biological perspective and the ecological perspective, but even getting to appreciate a, another culture that can be easily assimilated and integrated with what we see in the bush. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I have a question here um, that uh, I think would be appropriate for Debbie. Um, Debbie, can you talk a little bit about um, and the Flyway Expeditions programs, what is included in the cost and does that include a, any sort of donation either towards Audubon or these local communities? Sure, Lindsay. Um, well, this program, um, well, all of the Flyways programs have a donation included for the International Alliances program as well It's 150 for the IAP and 150 for your local Audubon or other bird club. Um, that's already built into the cost. And the, um, the Bahamas program, I think, you know, considering all of the internal flights, this is a, a very reasonable cost, especially for Bahamas that, you know, can tend to be pretty pricey as far as the hotels and things like that. Um, I feel that, uh, you know, you're going to get a great variety, like they've been talking about the different birds and, and the community opportunities as well as staying in, in some pretty nice pretty nice places that are not really super duper rustic. Excellent. Um, I'd like to welcome Lee Altadonna. Lee, we haven't heard from you yet, uh, but I'd like to welcome you uh, as uh, our, our uh, panelist as well. Um, and I have a question here that I'd like to uh, point your way, actually. Um, okay. Can you talk a little bit about um, whether in organizing a group program, can Audubon chapters participate on the same uh, same trip, on the same program in your experience? Um, it, well, it, it happened in my uh, circumstance. I'm president of the Wincote Audubon uh, chapter, and uh, having been on the National Audubon Board, was very aware that the Bahamas in particular uh, really offered an opportunity relative to many of our chapters that do coastal birding, are aware of the uh, piping plover and uh, uh, I think the uh, shorebird uh, effort here. I think on a personal uh, basis, uh, a friend that was part of uh, the chapter growing up uh, is a colleague of uh, Dave's who has been studying the uh, Perlin Warbler uh, in their wintering grounds, and uh, that is uh, Dr. Joseph Wonderly. And uh, that's what encouraged me to get involved as a chapter, although this is not a specific uh, trip for the Wincote Audubon chapter. Uh, what we've really been trying to do is to reach out to other chapters. Uh, uh, I was the former Atlantic Flyway North uh, National Audubon uh, board member, and I've had a lot of contact with uh, chapters that include some portions of the Great Lakes and Lake Erie, uh, where uh, one of our Pennsylvania chapters, Prescott Isle Audubon, is located, had their first breeding piping plover success this year after many years of absence. And I think it's just exciting to take a look at the conservation effort uh, that Audubon is a partner to uh, in terms of the Bahamas. And uh, the other part, again, uh, wearing my National Audubon board hat, 
is the uh, birds and climate initiative is particularly poignant here. Uh, sea level rise has got to be a significant issue in terms of uh, the shorebirds and in terms of some of these uh, places that uh, I'm really anxious to see. I've birded a lot in the Caribbean, uh, been in other places like uh, Colombia and Panama and Costa Rica birding. Certainly, uh, I, I, as much as anyone, like to see as many varieties and species of birds as there are. So I'm really anxious for um, the folks that may be going on this trip. I am, I am signed up for the March uh, trip uh, to really get a sense of the conservation challenges and to bring those back home to the chapter. Uh, you know, be uh, able to see a lot of birds, but also uh, you know, come back with uh, a real a deeper understanding of the conservation concerns. Hope that helps, Debbie or Lindsay. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have time for just a few more questions. Um, so if anyone has any last final questions they'd like to submit, please send them in. Um, this next question, I will uh, start with you, Dave, and then um, if anyone else would like to add uh, anything. Um, something that a few of you have touched on is the Kirtland's warbler um, and its uh, winter habitat. Um, the question has to do with uh, connecting uh, birds and their migratory paths, uh, birds that we may see uh, at home in our backyard feeders and kind of connecting that with their migratory path in these places like the Bahamas. Um, how do these kinds of trips help people make those connections? I think it's always invaluable to see a bird <clears throat> in a landscape you're not familiar with and then how that bird interacts not only with particular features of that landscape, but also how it's influenced by socioeconomic and agricultural practices. So if you take the Kirtland warbler, for example, it occurs in really remote jack pine forests with very little development, but the only activity that takes place is recreation and some limited forestry of low value jack pine. And then it's always exciting to see one of these birds pop up, say, in the middle of a goat farm, where one of the gentlemen we've been working with for a very long time, and Mr. Simonette, has been raising goats for a couple of decades. And what we have found is that the Kirtland warbler love his goat pastures because of the <laughs> relative abundance of wild sage and black torch. And it's just a, a great... Uh, wonderful guy because he in turn is mentoring others in the southern part of Eleuthera, which is one of the islands with a large number of Kirtland warblers, to also raise goats. So we hope to partner with him and see if we can encourage localized goat farming in those areas that we think may benefit the Kirtland warbler. Keep in mind these are not free-ranging goats, but they're within fences, so you're not going to have a lot of ecological damage and you can create local hotspots, we think, for the Kirtland warbler. So it's that kind of thing that you get to see on a trip like this, really sort of up close and personal, if you will, and makes you appreciate a bird, this one ounce bird, how it can adapt to so many different circumstances, how it can travel from the Bahamas to Michigan in eight days and do the same thing on the return flight. Uh, they take different migration routes based on some work of colleagues in the Smithsonian in spring and fall. Um, it just gives you a whole different appreciation of this little ball of feathers. <laughs> uh, Lee or Matt, would you, uh, do either of you have anything you'd like to add? I, I uh, this is Matt, I, I think one of the, I think David summed it up really nicely. I think you will see uh, your backyard birds. Um, we uh, certainly have, um, you know, we have the stories also from some of the tracking projects that are going on that tell the individual story of the individual birds. Uh, with the piping plover, we have um, brand new science that's just coming out on tracking them from the Bahamas back to the U.S. Uh, but we've actually been tracking them through the bands on their legs from um, from the Bahamas back to the U.S. Um, for several years, and so we've got a really some really great and interesting stories about the individual birds um, and the migration uh, pathways they use and, and how, the, how that works out, um, the, the sort of life histories, if you like, of the birds. So I think that's, that's sort of an opportunity to really get to know and understand 
how migration happens through uh, by following a specific bird like um, with a name. Um, and in in the forests uh, on all of the islands, um, you'll, you know, you, Dave talked about the Kirtland's warbler, but we'll see prairie warblers, and we'll see um, uh, possibly some some other species um, of warblers and other um, both shorebirds and forest birds, painted buntings and other things that um, you know that have that sort of uh, connection, and, and we'll be able to talk about and show that, you know the same birds you see in your backyards being present in the Bahamas and many of the other countries we're working into it really is um, often much easier to find those birds in the countries outside the US. Sure. You know, I could just add Lindsay, uh, you know I know uh, many folks have read uh, Scott Weinsall's book uh, Living on the Wind and you know uh, what Dave spoke about this you know little one ounce bundle of feathers and, and the uh, you know the enormous uh, distances that not only the Kirtland Warbler but many of our migrants uh, travel is just all inspiring but in addition to that um, really raising our consciousness about how the birds that sometimes we call our birds are really shared you know hemispherically and uh, how important the conservation issues to have these birds continuing to be in our backyards or in I our IBAs uh, here in our part of uh, North America how important it is to have the conservation initiatives and programs like this that um, help people to understand how important conservation in the Bahamas and other parts of the Caribbean and Central and South America are critical. That's a really good point. Thank you. Um, I think that's actually a really good note to end on. Um, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up the webinar for today. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for joining us and for sharing their expertise. So thank you uh, to all of you for being here. Um, and thank you as well to everyone who attended today. We hope you found the presentation interesting and informative. Uh, the webinar today has been recorded, so we'll be emailing each of you a replay to the webinar um, uh, within the next couple of days. So be on the lookout for that. Um, thank you again to all of our panelists, and I hope uh, everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.